everyone. So my topic is future of integration. So Chanaka gave uh, a pretty good overview about the enterprise integration and uh, what we are doing at the moment with WS2 integration platform. So my uh, objective is to give kind of a high level overview of the future of integration, uh, what are the new tre trends, and how WS2 is adopting those th things. And uh, also I would like to talk a bit about the next generation integration server. We are not calling it, e it an ESB, but uh, because it's not really an ESB, but, uh, but has a different scope and broad scope than a traditional ESB. So let's move on to the current state of uh, integration technologies landscape. So to be honest, a uh, couple of years back, I would say integration space, enterprise integration space is uh, kind of boring, uh, pretty much static. Uh, we always de deal with the IPs, uh, traditional ESB solutions. Uh, but now it is moving into uh, a dynamic space, which is, uh, which is due to uh, several reasons. Right? So, of course, we have a lot of technology ch changes, a lot of paradigm shift in the uh, technologies, uh, starting from uh, APIs, Internet of Things, SaaS, there is wide adaptation of all these technologies. And at the same time, there are the underneath technologies, things like Java 8 has emerged. There are different types of programming paradigms, such as reactive programming is coming up. So, so this is a very good time to rethink our integration. And this is exactly what we have done as a WSU2 uh, integration platform. We started rethinking our enterprise integration strategy. And uh, so in that process, I would like to talk a about, bit about the current trends in the integration and how WS2 integration server is uh, addressing those things. OK, so I'm not going to talk about enterprise integration. I'm not going to explain enterprise integration anymore, because Chan Chanaka already has done that. But I got this particular definition from uh, last year's Forrester report. Uh, what is what is really interesting about this definition is, uh, of course, we know that enterprise integration is all about integrating two different systems, two disparate systems. But this particular definition says uh, it is a technology for developing, maintaining, testing, deploying, and governing interface between disparate systems. So you can clearly see that. Enterprise integration is not just integrating two different systems, but the entire life cycle related to that has to be addressed from the uh, enterprise integration solutions. For the most part, the existing integration solutions, including WSO2, is not addressing the entire process. So that is something that we are going to consider when it comes to next generation integration platform. OK, so then I would like to talk about the future, tra uh, future trends and future integration needs. So let's start with uh, growth and the diversity of integration needs. So the top, uh, the top graph is on the growth of public APIs available uh, in the internet. So you can see there's exponential growth of the public APIs that are there in the internet. So it is keep on growing. The bottom graph is about number of IoT devices. Again, you can see a consistent growth of the IoT devices. So, uh, so with the proliferation of APIs, SaaS, IoT, uh, so there is an increasing need of integration because uh, APIs, for instance, are meant to be integrated. Right? So when you are designing an API, that means you are exposing the API to someone, someone else so that he can create some business on top of your API. So APIs are meant to be integrated, so as the IoT interfaces and SaaS, uh, SaaS applications. So integration needs are growing, and it is getting, uh, the requirements are very diverse because you have the API, SaaS, and all the other types of uh, Internet of Things, etc. At the same time, you have to still talk to your on-premise application, all the B2B proprietary and legacy systems, existing SOAP services, REST services, you have to integrate with those technologies as well. So that means the growth and the 
diversity of integration need uh, uh, has to be addressed. Okay, so along the lines, uh, along the same lines, uh, we have the agility and ease of integration. So one of the common requirement that we often see from our customers is uh, they, they really don't want to put, put a major effort into their integration. They don't want to put their top developers to do the integration. So the skill set required to do the integration should be minimal in order to address the future int integration need. Because you have to deal with a lot of APIs, a lot of applications. So you can't, put, uh, you can't invest more time or resources on doing the integration. So, and also, once you, d once you have done an integration, you, uh, you, you, need to you need to be able to customize the existing solution. Because uh, you may be adding or removing APIs quite frequently. So, and also the visual modeling is, is the key for next generation integration middleware because, uh, because of the very same fact, you have so many interfaces to be integrated, so you won't be doing that through a single XML file, complex Java code, or anything as such. And also, along with that, we need to have debugging, troubleshooting, and analytics should be an integral part of the solution. Uh, because analytics, debugging, those things should be considered when we, when we, when we start building the integration solution from the scratch. And also the streaming, streamlined development cycle so that uh, you build, you start designing the integration solution, you start developing it, then you move that into the QA production, to the life cycle promoting, et cetera, and at the same time you run integration tests. So this should be a streamlined process so that you, you are 100% guarantee that production uh, runtime that you are using is fully verified through a rigid uh, development life cycle. OK. Orchestration. So you may be wondering, orchestration was there ever since we start uh, enterprise integration. So what's the difference? So here I'm talking about orchestration, uh, like a huge orchestra. It's not a small one, but a very large orchestra kind of a use case. Right? So what it really means is uh, you have so many services and APIs. Right? So orchestration is becoming more and more important because uh, you have to integrate with so many services and APIs, so your orchestration logic becomes so complex. Uh, it logic becomes so complex, at the same time you have to deal with so many interfaces. So actually this particular diagram I have taken it from uh, Netflix. So for one Net Netflix API call, there are nine subsequent uh, backend calls going. So there is some orchestration happening at the uh, Net Netflix API level. So in their case, they have implemented with Java, Rx Java, the, because this logic is kind of uh, static. It's not frequently changing. But when it comes to real organizations, this is going to be the key. So actually, I was visiting eBay last week. So they said that their next uh, intention is to have their, they said the, the killer application for them is the orchestration engine that can orchestrate like 50, 60 services uh, with a end-to-end -end streamlined development process and visual modeling, etc. So what we really need in the next generation integration solutions is to have a simple and agile development of orchestration logic with the use of uh, visual modeling tools. OK, so then in the enterprise integration space, we more or less talk about integration based on the messages. Right? So there, are, there is a source system and a target system. You need to transform messages. You need to support different protocols, et cetera. But now the enter enterprise integration scope has changed so that you have to address different needs, starting from application and API, SaaS integration to data integration, as well as identity integration. That means you have different identity representations in two different systems, and you need to integrate those two disparate identities. So that is not, not the traditional ESB integration. So therefore, we need to address these 
different integration needs separately. So that's where, that's where our different solutions comes into the uh, solutions come into the picture. Things like integration server, data integration, identity bus, API gateway, or API composition server. So likewise, uh, the key idea is integration scope of the integration has drastically changed. Okay, so performance. So as WSO2 ESB, uh, in WSO2 ESB, we have been quite complacent with the performance because uh, we, we, we have been keep on improving the performance. Uh, but if you look at uh, this particular, so this, is, this graph shows you a particular API, popular API, and the growth of number of uh, traffic coming into the uh, API. So if your API is a really good API, you, you, you should expect this kind of a traffic shape. Right? You get, uh, this traffic has increased. So that is exactly what we have uh, experienced with eBay as well. So they were initially getting, they were initially handling one billion transactions per day. Uh, no, now at the moment they are using, they are handling around six billion. So you should expect more traffic coming into your API and your integration layer should be able to cope with that. So performance is a key aspect, number of transactions plus the latency. So that is, uh, so th that needs to be addressed. At the same time, we actually, we have to redefine performance again because of the Adaptations of uh, adaptation of the container-based architecture. Of course, the number of transactions and the latency is important, and that is important per container as well. And at, at the same time, the startup time, because if you are using container-based uh, development uh, deployment, then startup time is quite critical. So uh, at the moment, uh, we talk about startup time around 25, 30 seconds, but all the next generation products will have less than uh, between one to two seconds of startup time. And also, similar to that, memory footprint, distribution size, and average uh, CPU consumption and load average uh, per container is also quite important. So if you take existing solutions, they really don't address this uh, new parameters for uh, performance. Okay, then the scalability. So we used to scale based on the number of JVMs uh, per different integration solutions. Like you, you will have, uh, say you have five different integration solutions deployed into one runtime, and if you want to scale, you, you scale the entire runtime with all the five integration solutions. But with this uh, new requirement, you need to scale based on per API base, right? So that means, uh, say that you have three different APIs, you are getting more traffic into your, say, your shopping API, but in that case, you only want to scale that particular API. So, but with the current solutions, you can't do that because everything is deployed into the same runtime. Of course, one, you can run one ESB with that particular integration, Again, that ESB is very heavyweight. The start startup time and the memory footprint is high. So we need to address this uh, per application, per integration flow based scaling. So this is, uh, so we call it this, the micro integration. That means you develop one particular integration solution and you deploy that as a container. Right? And if you want to uh, scale it up, you can spawn up new, uh, uh, spin up new containers and scale that particular use case. So, so this is giving us uh, so much of control over that particular integration scenar scenario because that runs on top of a very lightweight runtime. So this is quite useful when it comes to microservice integration use cases. Uh, so that, that is quite aligned with the principles of microservices architecture. Okay, so then I move, uh, move into the next generation integration platform. The key objective of uh, the design and the architecture of the next generation integration platform is to address the aforementioned uh, integration, uh, future of integration uh, needs. 
And obviously, we don't want to build just another ESP, because as I said earlier, the integration uh, landscape has changed, scope has changed. So another ESP is not going to solve all those uh, uh, needs. And since we have different types of integration solutions, starting from data application and identity integration, we need to build a reusable framework that can be shared across, across different uh, integration solutions. And of course, this is built on top of Carbon 5. That's where all the startup time, uh, less startup time is coming from. <coughs> Sorry. So the first thing that we did as part of this effort is to finalize the messaging architecture of uh, Carbon 5 that is used inside our uh, ESB and uh, our integration server and other series of products. So the first thing we did was protocol. So we fully decoupled the protocol handling layer. That means all the transport-specific code is uh, inside the uh, protocol handlers, which are message consumers and producers. And we introduced the mediation engine as a fully decoupled layer into the middle. So if, uh, in the current ESP, we do have a bit of a tight coupling between the transport and the mediation layer. But in this case, the advantage is you can plug your, your own message processing engine. So that basically, we get that advantage because we can plug in our own message processing engine or message mediation engine. So, so we, we implement the protocol handling layer using Netty, and, uh, and also we inspired the pass-through architecture of WSO2, and we implemented that on top of Netty. And as the mediation engine, we initially plug Camel, as well as we can plug any, because of this architecture, we can plug any mediation engine into the, uh, this picture. So we managed to get a performance gain of 5 to 10x faster, which Chanaka showed earlier. That is from these uh, green lines, like green boxes. That is from the protocol handling layer. Because we get rid of access to synapse, uh, access to transports. There are a lot of uh, redundant things that we, that we have removed from this layer. So basically, we managed to get close to 10x faster performance with the new transport. So, then we face the problem of uh, choosing an en engine. So as I said earlier, you can plug in your own engine. So we have the options of uh, going to either Synapse or Apache Camel or any other engine. Then we evaluated uh, the previously mentioned integration requirements against the, these two different engines. So what we found was, uh, neither of uh, Synapse nor uh, Camel is going to fit is going to be a best fit for our next generation ESB because of several reasons. So both of these solutions are built with monolithic ESB in mind. And they are like very old, almost a decade old technologies, and not leveraging any of the new technologies like Java 8 or reactive programming. And they don't offer good tooling support or debugging as part of the na native engine. So native engine is decide, uh, designed uh, designed without considering debugging and all the other analytics support, but they are later plugged into the, to those engines. So because of these things, uh, and also it, they are not so lean and not container friendly, so, so we are not going to use either Synapse or Camel in our next generation integration platform. So we, we started building our own uh, integration engine, which is known as the gateway framework. OK, so this gives you a high-level overview of the components related to the uh, gateway framework and the integration platform. So as I said earlier, there are uh, the Carbon 5 platform and then the messaging platform. And then we have the gateway framework, which provides all the generic message mediation capabilities, things like filtering, routing, uh, subset of EIPs, and uh, all the generic capabilities are there in the framework. And on top of the gateway framework, we can build different solutions. So uh, integration, sol uh, integration server, API gateway, identity bus, data integration server. So likewise, there, we can build different solutions on top of this uh, gateway framework. 
and uh, and so actually we we released gateway as a separate product uh, last year because we felt like this is going to be used as a product in most cases in when it comes to microservices etc but then we realized gateway is no longer a product but it's a framework so that's the idea behind building a gateway framework and uh, and also the gateway framework will be the core of the next integration server etc And the most interesting aspect of the next generation ESB or integration server work is the visual modeling. So we, uh, we visual representation we inspired from sequence diagrams because uh, when you have to do explain some kind of a very complex thing, we often find sequence diagram is the best way to explain it. So we have several scenarios. We use sequence diagrams to explain our thread model error handling uh, to our customers. So we felt like why we should we we should try a sequence diagram approach to build the integration uh, the visual modeling tool. So we are not using the UML tools the the standard sequence diagram syntax, but we inspired some aspects from uh, sequence diagrams and we customize it into our uh, requirements. So let's take uh, this particular orchestration scenario and how we can model it with the new uh, integration servers uh, visual modeling. So scenario is uh, we have a client and ESB is doing orchestration between three different services. Quite straightforward, yet uh, this is quite uh, fairly complex. If you are uh, familiar with ESB technologies, this uh, needs to have some complex uh, business logic to implement this. Okay, so this is the visual model. So this is a mock UI, not the actual uh, visual modeling tool. So in that case, we defined uh, one inbound interfaces. That's where all the ports and all the uh, path context is configured. And from that, we have a pipeline. So inside that pipeline, you can have all the message processing elements. So these are similar to the existing mediators and the the endpoints, the backend services are represented as streamlines, and all the so these are actually endpoints. All the endpoint related configuration can be configured uh, at those outbound endpoints. So, if you look at this particular diagram and compare how you have done that with the existing ESB, so obviously you will find this quite, this is quite straightforward, and uh, this is directly addressing the uh, the enterprise integra uh, future of enterprise integration needs, things like uh, less technical person can uh, understand this, can modify it. It's quite easier. You don't need a Java developer to uh, edit this or uh, can customize this. So this is a preview of the current uh, visual modeling tool. And of course, we have a source representation or a textual representation of the same language. But what we have done was we initially we used the top-down approach. We started with this particular uh, visual model, and then we come up with the, uh, this particular language, so rather than uh, starting from the language and going back to the visual model, which is much more effective uh, in our case. Then the popular question, migration. How do we migrate from existing ESB into the new one? Of course, we believe that we can build quite handy uh, migration tools, but at the same time, 100% uh, seamless migration is not guaranteed because of there are a lot of changes. Platform has changed. This is based on C5. But we will make sure that we will give all the required help and the assistance when it comes to migration. Finally, so I would like to talk a bit about the future of hybrid integration platforms, uh, because hybrid integration is getting more and more popular. You, lo you no longer do on-premise integration only. You have to deal with integration in the cloud, integration in, in, in both, like uh, in, in the cloud as well as on-premise. So this is actually taken from recent Gartner uh, analysis on uh, hybrid integration platforms. So they have actually identified three different types of integrations 
One is the traditional on-premise integration. That's where you integrate your internal systems, ERPs, CRMs, etc. And then the IFAS layer, integration platform as a service, that's where you can do mid-complexity integration scenarios. So if, this is, if you have a mission-critical uh, scenario, that has to be implemented in your on-premise system. And all the performance-critical, mission-critical scenarios has to be implemented on-premise. And all the mid-complexity scenarios where the center of gravity is on cloud or mobile has to be, can be implemented in IPaaS layer. That means it's kind of a hosted ESP. You do the integration in the cloud and start using, uh, start running business on top of that cloud. ISAS uh, integration software as a service is a new, uh, new concept. It is more or less the social integration. Uh, say that you need to integrate your Facebook and Twitter when you do a Twitter update or Twitter message. So that needs to be uh, there in your Facebook. That kind of social integration. Uh, there are tools like uh, IFTT and uh, Sapir that uh, allows you to do that. And API management and self-service provisioning is also part of the hybrid integration platform. So as WSO2, how do we address hybrid integration requirements? Of course, we are focusing more on on-premise and IPaaS and not on ISAS. So if you look at this particular diagram, uh, on-premise, uh, that's where all the critical integration, IPaaS, mid-complex mid scenarios, and ISAS. So we only focus on uh, IPaaS and the on-premise, and API management, uh, application management is also part of uh, the picture. So the integration cloud will address the IPaaS requirements, and that is connected to the API and app cloud of WSO2. So that is how do, how do we address the new hybrid integration requirement uh, with the WSO2 platform. OK, so to summarize, uh, integration middleware is not disappearing. Uh, it's rather, it's growing to a broader scope and morphing to different offerings. And next generation WSO integration platform is addressing those uh, new paradigm shift in the enterprise integration space. 